In today's episode, I go back and revisit some questions from my very first Q&A. Let's see if my answers still hold up. Hey there, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and I wanted to try something a little different in this q and I've, I've, I've answered some questions here and there, kind of just you know pulling from similar questions that I maybe have touched on before, but I've never really gone back and intentionally commented on old questions that I've answered before. So that's what this one is going to be about, a Goulet Q&A redo, if you will. So I'm going to go back all the way about four years ago to the very first Goulet Q&A that I did, which I got to be honest, at that time, I didn't really have a clue what I was doing. I had seen some Q&A type of stuff that had been out there, nothing really in the pen world, and so it was a new concept concept and I wanted to try it. I was working with Tyler, our videographer at the time, and uh, he kind of gave me the initial seed of the idea. I was answering a lot of emails and I was doing a lot of um, other things. I'd done some live broadcasts with something called Right Time for you real hardcore folks that remember what that was back in the day. This was before Periscope and we were active on Instagram and all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it was really kind of a new format of thing and it went from like three days from conception to execution. I did not prepare a lot for the Q&A ahead of time, especially the first one. I took 28 different questions and answered them in one video, which now in retrospect is kind of crazy. Um, and I didn't get super deep on the questions either. So I thought it would be kind of fun to go back and you know, expound upon them a little bit, maybe see how I answered a couple of the questions initially. So I, I went through and I picked six out of the original 28 questions that I answered, and I wanted to update them, maybe comment on what my thinking was at the time, and maybe give you a fresh answer. So I thought it'd be kind of a fun take on uh, doing it, uh, and, and that would be kind of fun. So without further ado, here is the Goulet Q&A redo. Steven on Facebook wrote, okay, from this moment forward, you can only use one pen for the rest of your life. What pen do you choose in the following price ranges? These, some of these questions are pretty specific, you see. $50 or less, $125 or less, $250 or less, and finally, the sky is the limit, price is not an option. Be thankful I'm not asking you to choose only one ink, although I have a feeling it would be some shade of blue. Darn right it would be. Okay. Following price range is $50 or less. You know, honestly, I'm big fans of the Pilot Metropolitan and the Lamy All-Star in Safari, but I like the All-Star a little better. Uh, I would probably say, hmm, you know, I really like the Metropolitan, but I'd probably have to go with the Lamy because you get the different nib options. So probably my Ocean Blue Lamy All-Star would be my sub $50. 125 or less, uh, I would say probably my Monteverde Nighthawk um, just because that pen personally, I designed it. I, you know, wor worked hand in hand with coming up with that pen. I think it's super cool and stealthy. That would be my choice there. Uh, 250 or less, that would undoubtedly have to be um, Edison Nouveau Premier. Uh, again, that pen has a lot of sentimental value to me. It was the first pen that we collaborated with Brian Gray of Edison Pens, and uh, it's got a lot of meaning. It definitely helped design that pen, um, and so. It just means a lot to me there. And then finally, the sky's the limit. Gosh, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a lot of super expensive pens. You know, I I have some, like I have a Pelican M800 that's, that's really nice. Um, it's not my absolute favorite pen, but that one, if I had to choose one over 250, that's one of the few that I have that really is over a 250 pen. But, um, you know, that one is pretty good, um, M800. Yeah, I would. I guess I would go with that. I'll be honest with you, though. Once I get pens over 250, I don't really write with them very often because they're just too expensive. So I'm more of a utilitarian, hands-on kind of guy. So that's that's just kind of my opinion. Okay, so that one's a, a little bit dated, not 100% on point anymore. Um, so to to go with like my under $50 one, the Lamy All Star. It's still a really solid pen. I do love my Ocean Blue All-Star. Uh, one of my favorite All-Star, I think it's probably still my favorite All-Star color, though the copper orange is really pretty up there for me. Um, but 
Solid answer. I think I would tweak it and adjust it, update it a little bit. At the time, the Pilot Metropolitan was relatively new. I knew that it would be a great pen, but they've since come out with more colors. Originally, I, I can't remember the exact timing, but they might have only had the medium nib and not even the fine at that point. Of course, now the fine nib is, is incredible, and it's one of my most favorite pens. So I think the Metropolitan would probably end up having to dethrone the... Um, Safari, or sorry, the All Star for me uh, with that question. With a very honorable mention to the Twisby Eco as well. Uh, that pen has come out since that video and uh, the original video, and and I really do, I really do think the Eco is a fantastic pen, fantastic value. But the Pilot Metropolitan, for its various reasons, um, I think would have to be tops for me. So that one would need a little bit of a refresh, but not a total, total revamp. The next one though. The $125 one, the original answer I gave, um, and I didn't even show the pen, but this is it, the original Monteverde Nighthawk. So it's a very stealthy matte uh, carbon fiber pen, all stealth out. I really do love this pen. I wish that we were still able to offer it, but um, that pen went away, and then it came back in kind of a rebirth in the Conklin Nighthawk, which we have a Goulet nib on it now. And uh, I do like the style of this as well, of course. You know, it's a bit of a different thing. I actually, it, truth be told, I like the original kind of shape and stuff of the Avincia a little bit better uh, than the, the Conklin Nighthawk here. That's just, I'm being straight up honest, but um, because of the way that the pen had to be made to make it in a straight tube thing, we were able to avoid some of the um, issues that we had with uh, some bubbling and pitting and stuff like that in the matte carbon fiber finish. That's why the original Nighthawk had to go away. So the, the, the shape and everything of the Conklin one allows us to have it now, which of course I like that better because it actually can exist. <laughs> and of course having the Goulin nibs on is pretty sweet. We did have a little bit of an issue, and I think I've talked about this before in Q&A, but we did have a little bit of an issue when we first came out with it with the pen drying out a little bit because of um, basically not the, the air around the where the clip enters into the cap. Um, air was kind of escaping there, and so it wasn't it was drying out as it was sitting there a little bit. We have addressed that though, so that's not so much of an issue anymore. So um, I think, you know, and there's a lot of other pens that really fit into nicely into this kind of sub $125 range. You know, some very respectable ones, a lot of Twisbees fall in there, Lamy Studio, um, you know, other Lamy's and things like that. Um, still very solid in there, but I think the Nighthawk, the Conklin Nighthawk would dethrone and, and still, because it's near and dear to me, you know, it's a cool pen that we've been able to do some neat things with, and so um, that would have to replace the Monteverde Nighthawk. The next one I have as the kind of sub two hundred and fifty dollar one. Now this is a this is a tough one between like the one one twenty five and two fifty because now you're getting into gold nibs and stuff like that. So the original answer, um, you know, the Edison Nouveau Premier, of course, the Premier is is very special and near and dear to me. Um, come out with a lot of versions. We have the whole seasonal thing now, which we had not even come out with that at the time I started the original Q and A. So. Now, of course, that's that's very special to me, so it's really tough to kind of put that one up there. I, I think, um, you know, if it was like one pen, the original question about the one pen that you have to use for the rest of your life, um, you know, of course, the pen model to me, the Premier, is definitely... Um, is definitely really special to me and means a whole lot, but in terms of pens I'm actually using on a daily basis, if I have to be honest with myself, I think the Lamy 2000 would probably have to dethrone it. Um, I use a Lamy 2000 on a daily basis for my journaling at home. I keep one next to my nightstand and I use that to journal in my some lines a day notebook. Um, so I use that on a very regular basis. I keep the premieres. I have the most number of premieres, but if you're talking about like one single pen, the Lamy 2000 would probably have to dethrone that as much as I hate to say it. That's just a reality of kind of the pens I'm actually using these days. And then to update the unlimited one, I was like kind of embarrassed about this answer because I just really, at that time, I really didn't have a lot of experience with kind of $250 and up pens. Uh, but uh, I definitely have a lot more experience with that now. Of course, since then, we've you know gotten a number of higher end brands. We've gotten into higher end Auroras and Montegrappas and Visconti and of course a lot of the other brands, Namikis, I mean, goodness. Um, you know, if it was only one pen that I could use, of course, 
there is, you know, if price was no object, oh my gosh, this is such a hard question. I even prepared it ahead of time, but now I'm backtracking a little bit. There's so many nice Namiki pens out there that are just gorgeous. And if price was no object, oh man, there's just some really cool ones. So I'm gonna say what I what I already prepared. I'm like toiling over answering this question even as I'm doing it. Um, the, the, Vis the Visconti Homo Sapiens is like a pen that I've been carrying almost daily since I got it. Um, it was definitely a grail pen that I had for a number of reasons um, because I tried to carry the brand for four years and ultimately was able to and then got the Homo Sapiens. I'd heard hype about the Homo Sapiens for years and I kind of had a chip on my shoulder about Visconti not wanting to sell to us because we were online only for so long and then once we were able to actually carry the brand, um, of course, we've had uh, good success with it, and it's been a great brand for us. So, um, and and just this pen has been—I've been carrying it daily, and it's, I just love it. It's a great writer. So that one would absolutely push out the Pelican M800 for me. Um, but the Namikis, gosh, the Namiki Yukari Royale um, is such a fantastic pen, and the um, gosh, the Chrysanthemum Dew is such an amazing, amazing, gorgeous pen. That would be, I, I'm going to have to call it a tie between those two, between the Yukari Royale, the Miki, and the Homo Sapiens. Just the straight up lava bronze age, just nothing crazy fancy with it. It's going to be a tie for me. Cool. All right, let's go to the next question, shall we? Alec Johnson on YouTube, what's your favorite ink and pen combo that is not Liberty's Elysium and the Pilot Custom 74? Well, Alec, you obviously followed me a little bit. You know I'm <laughs> kind of a sucker for that. Um, okay, favorite penning combo that's not Liberty's Elysium or Custom 74. So I'm going to knock both of those out. Um, I really like the um, Pilot Metropolitan. I usually keep that inked up either with Diamine Red Dragon or Diamine Ancient Copper, just because I really kind of like those two colors, and especially in that nib size. Um, I'm also a fan of the Platinum 3776 or Platinum President with a medium nib with Diamine Majestic Blue. Really like Diamond Majestic Blue. It's that dark blue, but it's got kind of a reddish sheen to it. It's really kind of cool. I really like the, the saturated colors. Um, and then I'm also a fan of the Lamy 2000. I usually keep that inked up with like a Lamy Turquoise or maybe a um, Pilot Orochizuku Kanpeki, something like that. I really kind of have a thing for blue, don't I? <laughs> oh well. And of course you can see, even back then, I had a really hard time committing to like these, like, what is your one favorite thing? And I know that's a fun question. We get asked that all the time, but I just, I can't commit to it like that because I've got oh, 500 pens or something like that to say there's any one ultimate pen. I just don't have one ultimate of anything. So um, even then I was still just so skittish and didn't even want to give you one definitive answer. Um, but, you know, I think what, what it shows, and you'll see by the answer I give you here today, what it shows is that um, because of my experience with fountain pens, it's not like I was using them in school and have just decades of experience using them and I've really honed my process. This is still a process of discovery for me. So what's interesting is me going back and listening to what I, was my opinion four years ago, like the Metropolitan, that was a relatively new pen at that time. Diamond Red Dragon, Ancient Copper, those were newer inks at those times. And Red Dragon is still a, a fantastic ink. I do love that ink. Ancient Copper, you know, now I think what was so great about Ancient Copper at the time was a bit, a little bit of that kind of shimmery kind of look that it had to it. It's still a very popular ink and it's still kind of a unique color. But now you have things like the Shimmertastic and Jerbon has come out with a lot more 1670 inks and there have been a lot more, a lot more development in terms of, you know, these really fantastic ink properties. By fantastic, I mean like, you know, sensational kind of showy inks. Um, so Ancient Copper has kind of fallen by the wayside. I have not used that ink in, a, in quite a while. Um, and so it is kind of interesting to see like it was very point in time. You know, the Platinum 3776, the Platinum, Platinum President, you know, here's the 3776. This is my Chartres Blue, which I do love. I don't end up using these pens all that often though. The nibs are a little bit toothy. They're not quite as soft. It's just not much, as much my preference, though they are really solid pens. They're very well made and very beautiful. Um, Platinum President, I still, it was a pen that I was interested in at the time, but for whatever reason, import stuff like, you know, it's just the pricing is a little higher on these pens and one that I just, I haven't had a lot of interest in. Even still, four years later, haven't had a lot of interest in it. I haven't used my President in, in quite a while. 
the, the nib is kind of cool. It's this kind of like Art Deco look to it. So the President would be on the outs for me um, based off that one, 37 to 76. Really not so much anymore. If anything, the vanishing point would take place at 3776 um, as kind of an old standby for me. Um, Lamy 2000, though, would hold up. The Lamy Turquoise, not so much. Haven't used that quite as much, though. It is a really solid turquoise ink, um, though Diamine Marine has really kind of taken place of that. Um, Diamine Majestic Blue, going back to the Platinum, though, that is a fa fantastic ink. Still love that one very much. Pilot Rosh Zuku Konpeki that I answered in there, I would say that uh, it's a really solid blue, still love it. Haven't been using it as much recently, so that one would probably not be in there quite as much, though, I don't know, it's really solid. Um, so <laughs> the thing is for me now, like back then, you know, I had I didn't have quite as many brands. There were there was a lot of ink back then, but there weren't as many like new inks coming out. I feel like there have been a lot of new inks coming out, and especially new brands that have been coming out. Um, you know, things like Robert Oster, been a lot of revamps and other things like that. So um, I, I have been spending uh, less time using individual inks and pens in the last four years as I did in the first few. So, you know, I've gotten more experience with a lot of different pens and inks and stuff like that. But because of the expansion that we've had and because of how many different things I've wanted to experience and get to know, I haven't been like using one combo of pen and ink as much, ex with some rare exceptions, like uh, my Visconti with Diamine Marine, I've been using that quite a bit. I use a Lamy 2000 with Noodler's Black pretty religiously. Um, you know, I keep a Twisby uh, Eco with Jerobon Emerald of Shavor and a broad nib because I it shimmers like friggin' crazy. Um, I do like to use that. Beyond those kind of, those three really, four maybe different pens that I kind of keep inked up with regular colors, everything else is constant change. So um, that's part of the experience for me. I really don't want to just narrow it down to one, um, you know, pen ink combo. Um, but the thing that I've been using pretty regularly for the longest really has been my Homo sapiens with Dimene Marine, though I have to be 100% honest with you. I think I'm going to change that because I'm just, you know, I, Marine's been a great ink, but there's just too many others that I want to experience. So I think I'm going to start mixing it up. This pen is a little bit of a, more of a pain to clean because of the power filler and stuff like that. It's not quite as easy as a cartridge converter. So uh, I don't like to change it quite as much. Uh, but I've been using, you know, Robert Oster has been a newer brand. Very fantastic performing inks that I've really enjoyed getting to know them. And, and Blue Water Ice shades like crazy. It's, uh, it's more of a blue than a green, like Marine is more of a green. Robert Oster Blue Water Ice is more of a blue, and I've kind of been digging that. It's got a little bit of red sheen at times, too. So, um, you know, I do kind of dig that one. So, But that's very much kind of point in time. I don't know if Blue Water Ice will really hold up. If I go and visit this again in four years, we shall see. Maybe dating myself a little bit, but... Um, you know, again, I'm kind of keeping the trend of not wanting to commit to one single combo, but those are some uh, kind of point in time things that I'm using at the moment, four years later. Okay, Brett Poole on YouTube. Why do you only sell your current selection? Do you have plans on branching out into different brands like Visconti or Mont Blanc? Also, would you consider a pen refurbishing or trade-in model? Okay, so that's like several questions in there. Uh, basically, why do I sell what I sell? Well, a lot of it has to do with what do I have experience with? Um, I am an enthusiast as well as a retailer. So usually my process for actually carrying a brand will be, let me buy it, try it for myself, use it. If I like it, if it seems to be a good value to me as an enthusiast first, then I'll get behind selling it. I don't carry something if I don't believe in it. So that's kind of my first check. Now brands like Visconti, Mont Blanc, um, you know, Faber-Castell, some of these more expensive kind of premium brands, they may have their own rules about who they want to carry. Some of those more premium brands, they may want you to be an established brick and mortar store before you carry their brands. We're an online only store here, so I don't qualify in their eyes necessarily for who they want to represent their brand. So there may be a brand that I am interested in pursuing, but they don't want me to carry their stuff or they just never get back to me or they're too busy to give me the time of day, whatever the case is. I'm not saying that's the specific case for any of these ones that are named, but that's kind of what's going on. So if I want something, I will go after it. And if they respond, then I will carry it. If they don't respond, I will keep on asking them and try and wear them down. <laughs> 
Uh, and regarding would you consider a pen refurbishing or trade-in model, not really. Um, that's really a different way of doing business than I currently do it, and I view it as a diversion. I've got a great thing going on with the way we run a company now, and I'm not so interested with doing trade-ins because it's a whole different way of doing things. Not to say it couldn't ever happen, but it's not on my radar. <laughs> so I thought, I thought this question would be interesting to answer because it was very kind of point in time. Um, you know, there's some things about this that really haven't changed at all. Um, in terms of, you know, me using my own pen experience and being an enthusiast, like I'm still very much an enthusiast. I still use my own kind of passion and experience very heavily into making product, uh, you know, decisions about what we carry here at Goulet. The thing is now we are so much larger and we have a whole team of people that are talking to you on email, live chat, phones, all of our various social media channels. My team is a lot more experienced and has a lot more input as far as what pens might be good or why, or, you know, and things like that. So it's not as much a decision made in a bubble anymore. Like it used to be Rachel and I were really heavy. We had a lot of the product knowledge and experience. You know, we had we had a couple of team members at the time I shot this video. The first time, we had a couple of team members that have been here a year, year or two. Now we have people that have been here four, five, six years with us. So they really have been in the journey with us for quite some time. So we value their input very heavily. So we have um, structured our um, product, you know, carrying decisions to get input from a lot of our team so that it's not just me and Rachel deciding things kind of more on a whim, which is really kind of what it was back in the day, um, is just we, we knew from being active on all the social channels and managing everything ourselves and, and just playing with the pens all the time ourselves to now it's like we have a whole team that everybody's got a different perspective and we take that input to account, but still it's really me and Rachel that are kind of making those final decisions. What do we carry, what do we not carry and stuff like that because ultimately it's our company and we got to make those decisions from branding and, and you know money perspective. So we still make those decisions, but we do it with a whole lot of team input. So um, you know it's, it's a more robust version of that. It still looks a little bit differently, but ultimately it's really not that fundamentally different from what it was when I answered this uh, four years ago, it just it looks different in terms of how we do that because of the size that we are and, and the reach and how many customers, how many opinions we're getting. We've had to tweak it a little bit, but fundamentally still the same. Um, and then uh, I thought it was really funny talking about brands like Visconti and Faber-Castell because uh, we have those now. So that was really kind of cool. I, I liked when I went in there and was like, you know, we're gonna wear them down because um, that's kind of what ended up happening. Ever Castell, not so much. That was a little more opportunistic. They were right for it. Visconti, we really had to pursue them. Um, and ultimately, we kind of got the foot in the door. And then, of course, it was uh, it was a, a match made in heaven uh, for carrying them. So uh, still nothing from Mont Blanc, though. Um, we have reached out to them since this video, and I've gotten an email back basically saying they're not interested in online-only stores. They want to focus on brick and mortar, which is totally their prerogative. Um, I have had experience with Mont Blanc and I have several of them now. I really had no experience with them at the time I shot this and I just had people, you know, from a branding perspective, Mont Blanc, I get asked about them a lot whenever I say, you know, hey, I, yeah, I'm, in the, I'm in the fountain pen business or people are like, oh, you sell nice pens, do you sell like Mont Blancs, right? And I'm like, okay, yes, like Mont Blancs, but not actually Mont Blanc because people, people who are in the pen world don't really have any context. They just know that Mont Blanc is a brand that is very recognizable outside of the pen community. You know, it's usually like Mont Blanc or Cross or maybe Parker that I'll get asked about. And I'm kind of like, well, Cross and Parker, not so much. <laughs> and Mont Blanc, well, we don't have them either. It's like funny that the, the pen brands that I get asked about uh, from people that aren't in the pen industry uh, are all the ones that we don't carry. So go figure. But yet, clearly, we're like deep in the pen. Anyway, um, so uh, Mont Blanc is not knocking on our door, but you know, I'm still open to that if that were to ever happen in the future. So if anybody from Mont Blanc is watching, give me a call. Bob on Ink Nouveau. What do you think is the dollar threshold where a fountain pen's writing performance does not get any better if you spend more money? For example, does a $100 pen write as good as you're likely to get regardless of what you spend? That's a good question. And that's a question that really comes down to personal preference. Some people will gawk 
at a $20 pen saying, how could you possibly pay that much for one pen? I can buy a pack of 20 ballpoint pens for $2. Uh, other people will say, you know, oh, it's a $1,000 limited edition pen? Okay, that's cool, I can have that in my collection, I'll take it. You know, it really just depends on how much you're into pens and what you see as a value for the pen. But your, your question, Bob, was dollar threshold of rare pens writing performance does not get any better. So that can, that, there's a little, there's fewer factors. You don't get into the artistry, design, filling mechanisms, blah, blah, blah. Um, performance, I, I think more writability, usability, reliability, that kind of thing. Um, maybe maybe the, the filling mechanism might come into play on that one. I shouldn't have lumped that with the other one that's not as important, but um, okay, so it'll vary. For some people, the Lamy Safari or the Pilot Metropolitan is as good as it gets and they don't see justifying spending any more money than that or maybe the Twisby or you know something like that. Uh, they, don't, they don't justify anything higher than that. Um, for me, I think pens, um, you know, it, when you get into gold nibs and you're talking about pen prices, generally speaking, when you get over a hundred dollars, a pen's got to be kind of special to still have a steel nib. Um, you know, you, you start to get into pens that have more design, have some cooler features to it. Um, when you get around $140, that's when pens start to come with gold nibs. And gold nibs are not inherently better than steel nibs necessarily. They're different. They're a little softer. They're, you know, they're not necessarily smoother. Um, because if you're talking about the tipping, the tipping is a separate metal anyway than steel or gold. But it can feel a little smoother because of the springiness of the gold nib. Uh, but anyway, so you may get into, being in the higher price, you may have um, a, a greater likelihood of having a higher quality control within a company because they're more expensive pens, they may spend more time tuning the nib and stuff like that, so there's other factors like that. Um, I would say probably, if you're talking about pure utility, if you get over $200, that's when the writing performance probably doesn't vary quite as much. You're getting into other factors like design, um, you know, meaning, meaningful relevance and stuff behind why the pen was created, the history, the collaboration, artistry, that kind of stuff, packaging. Um, you know, I think about pens like the Pilot Custom 74, the Lamy 2000, those are like $150, $160 pens that write pretty darn good. And I've used, you know, $800 Pelicans that I don't really feel write much better than, you know, $150 Lamy or Pilot. So it'll all come down to personal preference. Pens are a very personal thing. But for me, that's kind of, I guess, where my threshold is in terms of pure writing performance. Of course, it varies by brand too. So, huge, huge disclaimer on that statement that is very, very general. So, this is one where I was actually pretty impressed or surprised. Not really surprised, but I was like, yeah, I feel good. Like, this one still holds up. Like, I still would pretty much, with rare exception, would pretty much hold to my original answer here. Um, I think that, you know, whenever you have a question like this, especially relating to pricing and performance, stuff like that, the context can change so much because you get inflation or deflation or there's a lot of things that can happen in terms of pricing. You know, there could be innovative technologies that could disrupt certain price points and things like that. And definitely there has been some of that, but I think that uh, my original answer still pretty much holds up that when you get into that, you know, kind of $200 and up price range, it's the, the writability, the writing itself doesn't necessarily translate into a better performance just because the price is going up. I think once you get into gold nibs, that certainly changes the game a little bit, and there's some stuff that can happen. And there are certainly certain nibs, like when you get into like the Visconti Palladium nibs, I really like the way those write. Um, if you get into like, there are certain nibs, like the Pelican M1000 nib, that one is kind of in a league of its own just because of its softness. And, um, you know, there's other ones like uh, the, the Namiki Emperor nib is this giant kind of custom nib. So there's certain ones like that that kind of stand out a little bit that get into that really expensive range. But I think there's a law of diminishing returns. Once you hit kind of like the $200 price point, the, the amount you pay to get maybe a little bit, not necessarily better, but maybe a different writing experience that would be better for some 
it's gonna get it's gonna get much more expensive without necessarily a whole lot of gain. So I would still pretty much hold to that two hundred dollar limit as being true. Um, there's a lot of other factors that go into the pricing for that that justify it in a lot of people's minds and maybe not for others. But in terms of pure writing performance, I would still hold to that. Sam on Ink Nouveau, what's your favorite ink and why? Any color that you consider yours. Uh, there's two inks that I would consider mine, and those would be ones that I have helped design. One of them is Noodler's Purple Heart, which you see this uh, drawing right here done by artist said no con, that's done in Purple Heart. And that was done as an inspiration from George Washington and the Badge of Military Merit, now known as the Purple Heart. And uh, I really wanted to create kind of a, um, a Virginia history George Washington ink. I'm a big fan of George Washington and what he's done. Uh, and so I um, developed that ink with Nathan Tardiff of Noodlers, and there's a lot of meaning behind that. Uh, but even probably even more so than that one is Liberty's Elysium, because it's a blue ink, and I just am sucker for blue. But that's, that's a similar kind of vein of creating a, a Virginia history ink um, around Patrick Henry. It's also got Nathan Hale in there. Um, and so um, Nathan kind of helped me with that one. And so those two inks are a particular significance to me. So for this one, uh, I wanted to revisit this one because it was, you know, anything I consider mine or my favorite ink or whatever. I did kind of just talk about this a little bit earlier with my favorite pen ink combo sort of thing. Um, but specifically, you know, I had Noodler's Purple Heart and Liberty's Elysium. You know, I might have thought back then that I would have developed more inks with Noodler's, but, you know, honestly, Nathan Tardif is pretty maxed out, and so I've talked a little bit here and there about some ideas for new colors, but haven't come up with anything yet, so I don't have anything really that's dethroned in terms of what I feel is mine, right? Especially because of how much meaning and input I went into with Nathan on those two particular inks. I think Liberty's Elysium would definitely be number one still. That holds up. It's a very popular ink. It's been around. It's definitely held its own uh, out there in the community. And then in terms of myself, I'm not using it daily quite as much anymore because I'm trying to experience a lot of other different inks. Uh, but that one definitely still kind of holds it uh, up there for me. Um, what is interesting, though, is that, you know, in terms of favorite inks and stuff like that, there have been a lot of inks that have come out since this video uh, originally. So Diming has had a lot of great colors, like the entire Shimmertastic line uh, has come out. So that's, that's definitely there. Karen Dash has revamped their whole line. Monteverde has revamped their whole line. Stipula has revamped their whole line. Um, we've had other brands that we've added, like Robert Oster. We've had a lot of changes with Diatramentis. I remember exactly when we started with the Atramentis. It would have been around that time, though. So, you know, there's been a lot of expansion there. Um, so there's been a lot that's changed in the ink world in the last four years, really, especially when you consider, you know, what was happening kind of before that. You know, for the inks for decades was nothing really crazy or super interesting was happening. And then especially in the last 10 to 15 years or so, there's been so much that's been happening. You know, brands like uh, Private Reserve and Noodler started to really push the envelope and then Diming and Detrimentis and other things. And now you've got things like Robert Oster and you know, KWZ and some other like boutique brands that are coming out with some really kind of pushing the envelope doing some innovative things. So that's really kind of cool. So um, for me, Liberty's Elysium still holds top for me, uh, but the one that I want to give an honorable mention to is uh, Jerobon Emerald of Shavor. I just, I love that ink. I use it on a very regular basis and I really like it. I wouldn't really consider it mine, but uh, I do, I, that one definitely holds a special place for me. Arnim Summer on YouTube, which ink does the world still lack? That's a great question because oftentimes when I talk to people and I say, yeah, we carry about 600 inks, give or take, on my on my site they're like 600 how could there possibly be that many i'm like yeah there's about 50 different blacks <laughs> and it's like why are there so many black inks you know and it's true what ink does the world still lack well you know that's gonna that's gonna vary but there are some that i've uh, people have said like a good bulletproof you know purple or green uh you know getting into some inks with very specific properties you know you could get other colors of whiteboard inks and stuff like that um so if there is an ink that still lacks 
you know, maybe I'll work with Nathan, we'll try and develop it, but <laughs> I don't have anything specific in mind. I think that, you know, a lot of people would like to see like a Parker Penman Sapphire, you know, recreation or something like that. Um, you know, maybe that's lacking, but uh, you know, in general, I, I would say I'm pretty happy with the number of inks that are out right now. I'm always eager to see more come out, but there really aren't a lot of holes out there uh, for them. But if there are, maybe, maybe I'll help to fill them. So this was an interesting one. This is also an example of how I really haven't changed that much in the last four years. I really hate giving like one single definitive answer. Have you noticed that? Um, which ink does the world still lack? I, I can't name you just one ink. So I'll kind of address what I talked about in the original one because I think there's some really kind of funny and interesting things to update there. You know, the bold blue, purple or green, I, you, you know, that's fine. That would be great. It hasn't been really a whole lot. I mean, the thing that has come out is the, um, the detriment is document inks. So, you know, that has kind of largely been addressed because you've got purples and greens in both of those. Not bulletproof necessarily. That's a, that's a noodler's term. But I think what I was implying back then was really something that's quite permanent. So, you know, that there has been some development in that way. So that's been kind of addressed. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, other colors of whiteboard inks, I wasn't really confident when I gave that answer in the first place and nothing has happened in that way and I don't think anybody really cares. So that's really fine. Uh, it doesn't really need to be there. Um, you know, Parker Penman Sapphire, I mentioned that one. I hear a whole lot less about that now than I was four years ago. Um, that was an ink that was available only from like 1990 to 94. Um, and it's a beautiful color, but really it looks almost exactly like several other colors that are so close now, which I think is why it's just not talked about as much anymore, because literally, I'm not joking, um, you get a, bar a bottle of Parker Penman Sapphire, um, and I have one here to show you. So here is a bottle of the original stuff, um, and it's this dark blue with a red sheen. Um, it's a really kind of a cool bottle, and it had this little insert in it, so you could turn it upside down and fill it. Um, it's this deep blue, you know, the, the chemical properties of this were different than other inks, and it was not very compatible, so it would cause some trouble with some pens, which is why they discontinued it. But um, I think the colors like Diamond Majestic Blue, Noodler's Ottoman Azure, and then even like Diatramentis has, you know, Indigo Blue and uh, Atlantic Blue. So there's a lot of colors that are close enough to it where I don't really hear about this one anymore, so I kind of would not really count this one anymore. Um, and I've said, you know, I'm generally happy with what's come out. I think that's true. I, there's been a lot of stuff that has come out that I just really, that I really didn't foresee almost. You know, I think about at that time, there really weren't a lot of shimmering inks. I think really you pretty much had the Jerobon Rouge Hematite, which was very popular, I will say. But even at that time, I did not, I did not really expect the kind of shimmering ink to really come out and just kind of take over, not take over, but be as popular as it has been. Of course, at that time, um, you know, Instagram was really in its infancy. And I think Instagram and just, you know, having a very picture-based social media platform like that really taking off um, has given uh, a platform for a lot of these very kind of showy inks, I'll call it, um, to really take off. So that's where I'm seeing a lot of this stuff is, is on Instagram. And so, you know, that is, that is definitely something that's taken off that uh, I, th I apparently was lacking in the world because now you look at the various options that there are and I see, I see that it's hard to know if that's like gonna be a fad or if it's gonna be here to stay, but you've had a, you know, the Shimmering Inks out for a number of years and they still are pretty popular and people enjoy using them. I think, um, you know, the fountain pen purists would probably scoff at that as being something that like was lacking in the world. But uh, in terms of my perspective, I think that having the shimmering inks and stuff like that has actually drawn in a lot of people who would not inherently be necessarily fountain pen enthusiasts, but people who are kind of more hand lettering and, and into calligraphy and stuff like that, that have kind of been exposed and, and brought into the fountain pen world because of these shimmering inks, because they're kind of a crossover into those, into those um, you know, uh, uh, communities. So I actually really kind of like that aspect of it. And then they come in and they get to experience fountain pens and kind of all their awesomeness. So um, if there was one thing that I had to say at this point to kind of update this question, as to what I think uh, could be lacking in the world. It's like, I didn't really expect the shimmering thing to be what it is, but um, there's definitely been, always been a ton of excitement around any ink with 
um, kind of different colors in it. You know, I think about things like Jerry Bon Emerald of Shabor. Um, I think about all the shimmering inks and stuff that, you know, has a sheen or glitter or anything like that to it. Yes, I think, you know, just putting different colors of glitter in different inks, I think that will run its course. At some point, the, the market will be saturated, if you will. Yes, pun 100% intended. Uh, on, you know, just having, you know, sparkly stuff in ink, there will be at some point where it will be like, all right, how many sparkles do we really need? But I think there could be something similar to that concept where you're having not necessarily sparkles, but having some other kind of color shifting type of uh, feature in ink. Maybe there's some technology that's like, just hasn't quite bridged into fountain pens yet, but having a little bit more of a dye based instead of a pigment based color shifting kind of thing. Because when you get into, when you get into the shimmering inks, you're literally talking about a particulate, you know, a glittery particulate that's put, it's very fine particulate, but it's a particulate that's put into the ink that allows it to do that function. I think maybe there's some kind of chemical property that could be interesting that could um, do something somewhat similar. Sort of like you have some inks that have sheen. I don't think it's necessarily particulate that's in there. I think it's a property that dyes. I think you could get into something where you get into some kind of color shifting or you think about like candy paint or chameleon paint like you have on a car. You look at it at different angles and it has a different color. You can shift from like green to purple or blue to pink or something like that. I think it would be cool to have something like that in a more kind of conventional dye-based uh, pen ink. That's just something I haven't really seen that. I've seen glimpses of that. You know, when you talk about inks like, you know, the Penman Sapphire, or you get into the Majestic Blue or something like that, you get into those heavy sheening inks. I think there's an opportunity for sheen to happen in inks uh, that maybe aren't there presently and getting into, especially getting into colors that are very different than the base color. Could be really interesting. I think there's an opportunity for something like that out there. I have no idea chemically how to come up with that, but I do think it would be really kind of cool. So there you go. That is the redo for Gula Q&A, um, revisiting the first one I ever did. Uh, my question of the week for this week is, well, really basically, how did you like this? How did you like the revamp? Is it worth doing? Uh, is it worth updating? Or do you feel like, yeah, Brian, you don't need to go back and update anything because you are just so insightful about the future that your answers hold up well for four years. <laughs> I don't know. I'd love to have your feedback on that. You can leave that in the comments. You can check out a number of the things that I've talked about, at least in, in the recent updated version on GoulayPens.com and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. I uh, hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks so much for watching and right on.